I'm Radhika Jones from Time Magazine, and I recently sat down with author Tom Wolfe, whose classic account of Ken Kesey and his merry pranksters, The Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test, has been reissued in paperback this month on the occasion of its 40th anniversary. He answered a few questions from Time readers. Mr. Wolfe, thanks for joining us. My pleasure, my pleasure. Posted by Kaber Vasuki in Coimbatore, India, when did you first realize that you wanted to write? It was very early in my life. I was, I think, six years old. My father was an, an agronomist, an agricultural scientist, um, at a time when that was really an exciting, an exciting field. But at the moment that I was first aware that he worked, that he went to work every day and all that kind of thing, he was editing a farm magazine. But I would see him at home writing. He had a terrible handwriting, on, literally on yellow legal pads. And somehow this would be converted two weeks later into this pristine type on a page. That's a great time in life when comic strips are magical. Everything you see is magical. Uh, I said, this is just great. This, he, he just stays at home, he writes, and then this fabulous thing comes out. So that was my intention from the very uh, beginning. I am Charlotte Simmons. Bonfire of the Vanities and Acid Test each examines a specific aspect of American society at a particular time. How do you decide which slice of America to tackle? I like to write about something that I've heard of first in conversation. In the case of, uh, let's say, I am Charlotte Simmons, while I was working on A Man in Full, I started hearing stories about campus life and particularly about uh, you know, co-ed dorms. Mm -hmm. uh, I couldn't believe the scarcity of literature about co-ed dorms. And here's the potentially salacious uh, subject. Why weren't there, wasn't anybody looking at it? And the other thing is, by this time, universities were creating moral standards. Right. You know, something like uh, the rights of women. It didn't come out of a church. No. It came from out of the universities. So for those two uh, reasons, I got interested, and I started going around uh, uh, colleges. You were once critical of contemporary novelists and their reluctance to engage in contemporary issues. What are your feelings about the current state of the novel? There's so little of that now. It's just pathetic. And it's pathetic all over the Western world. What happened here is really sad. It really is. That was a great the great period of American literature, the only great period of American literature, was from 1893 to 1939. Uh, 1893 was the year that uh, Stephen Crane published Maggie, A Girl of the Streets, mm -hmm. which was the first American urban novel. And the final in the sequence was John Steinbeck in 1939 with The Grapes of Wrath. Now, that was such a great period that um, it was uh, referred to over and over again as the, you know, the, the flowering of American mm -hmm. uh, literature. And it influenced writers all over the world. And in France, they were going for the psychological. It seemed more elegant than all this mucking around in, uh, in real life. <clears throat> and it happened in the Master of Fine Arts programs at the universities. That's where writers come from now, the Master of Fine Arts programs. I mean, if you, you add up the education of the college education of Steinbeck, Hemingway, uh, Faulkner, you would you got to about spring break of the freshman year. <laughs> but today they they're all getting the Master of Fine Arts programs, and they're in, they're told to you know write about what you know, your inner psychology. Never mind um, your external troubles, and it's just boring. Well, and it's funny because of course, as you were saying earlier. The thing to do is to write about what you don't know. Well, that's my, I mean, that's the journalist in me. I'd like to write about what I, I don't know. Um, you know. What do I know about Miami? That's where this book is, uh, is, is set. What did I know about plantation in Georgia? Nothing in The Man in Full. You know, it's not that the working in nonfiction reporting uh, is going to give you just colorful facts. It's going to stimulate your imagination. Mm -hmm. It's going to make you think of things you never thought of um, before. This is from David Royce in Westport, Connecticut. Do you ever get tired of being known for the white suit? I don't get tired of the white suit. It's done me so much good. I cannot 
tell you. When I first came to New York, it had been my, as, a, as a reporter, and it had always been my goal. And I finally got a job in the old New York Herald Tribune. I went to a store and I bought a white suit. Well, that wasn't unusual in Richmond, Virginia, where I grew up. My father used to have white linen suits, even though it was very conservatively cut. And it just annoyed people beyond belief, but they didn't know what to say. And for some reason, getting dressed in the morning for the first time became fun. I don't know what that says about me. I don't have Dr. Freud's nightline. And then it had another very practical advantage. But this, it wasn't long after that, I published my first book. Mm -hmm. And I was used to interviewing other people. And I thought I was pretty good at that. I had never been interviewed in my life. And I quickly found out I was terrible at it. I was never relaxed. I, I had no idea what to say. I said, I've really blown that. And then I read the piece, and essentially the piece said, isn't he an interesting man? He wears white suits. <laughs> <laughs> and so it was a good 10 years that I had the white suits were a substitute for a personality. <laughs> I must confess sometimes I do not wear a necktie. I, that's, that's, that's honest.